All right, we're in Luke 13. Um, uh, those of you here last week, thank you to Dr. Bossom. I am, um, I, I, if you're, I, those, you've been with me a while. The Labor Day weekend is my century cycle ride, and I've forgotten all about it, so finally threw in Dr. Bossom. So thank you to Dr. Bossom. We, uh, we will pick up in Luke 13. Um, I have I've read this, this chapter several times this week, and I couldn't figure out why, and I know not why, not, not, to sh- you know, not for other reasons, it's, it's my, my study reason, or my, uh, a paper that I'm writing reason, and I couldn't figure out why God kept making me do my, I was doing my paper, and I, God kept making me work on my Sunday school. And you notice that bizarre thing, and it's it's really clear. You know, when you when you when you're really engaged in scripture, of which I have to be, not through choice. I don't mean it to sound like that. As in, I'm reading scripture because I have to, rather than through choice. So I end up in lots of parts of scripture at the moment, and I'm doing this paper, which is I've been doing for months, and it's got to be due. It's due next Monday, but I'm you know I'm not behind. I've done it, but God kept sending me back to. The Sunday School lesson today, Luke 13, and it has nothing to do with the paper I'm writing. Not one thing, as I thought. Right? As I thought. And this morning, I was in it again. And it's suddenly, you know, you get that clarity moment where I'm just not very clever and I am simple. And God sort of opens your eyes and he, and it's, it's the sort of, here's your sign, you know, that moment. I had that real moment this morning and I... I wish all of you, I, I really want us all, you should, you should take scripture and meditate and reflect on it. doesn't matter what it is. Just take a section of scripture and really meditate. And God says, read it over and over again. Read it over and over again. And you have no idea why he's telling you to read it over and over again. And then suddenly it'll come to just glaring, apparent, why you're reading it. And it, I'm, I'm going to admit to you all, I'm very humbled by this. This, I'm old man, and this is brand new to me. And I'm, I'm just stunned that it's so brand new to me. This reflecting on, on Psalms and reflecting on Scripture, and instead of trying to pull it apart and find out Greek and what does the Hebrew mean, blah, 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 blah. What does God want to tell me in this Scripture? And I'm new to it. I'm, I feel like a child again. Anyway. I'm sorry, I've been indulgent. Yes, ma'am. My paper is on the... Um, I am writing a paper on the, the logic, the logical, coherent, and scriptural underpinning of Christianity as it pertains to the Trinity. I'm glad that you were not me. Well, it sounded like he made a connection for you through this. He did. Okay, great. He did. He did, which I will get to in and out. All right, let's go. 13. So I've made another decision as part of my repentance. I'm no longer going to read scripture. You're going to do it, okay? And I've been really convinced on this through several things that have been coming to me, and we're all going to do it, men and women, all right? Because I've been, I've, been, I've been working with several things in the school. I've been reading, so I've been helping some people through this, this oddity that we, we have where women of authority, etc., etc. And it's a real problem for certain people. But reading scripture and praying is, is scriptural. It's right there in scripture. And I am not a practicer of this. And I've been convicted by God that we are about to be, this class is going to be practices of, of the prayer, the prophesying, and the reading of scripture. So on that note, on that note, Andrea, would you start reading, please? Sure. Just 13. 13. Until I say stop. There were some present. At that very time, he told them about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all of the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eight, 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all, all the others he killed in Jerusalem? Who, I'm sorry, who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all let them All right, questions, observations. This particular passage of Scripture, 13, 
is a pre or a foretelling of the big repentance scripture in Luke 15, which we will do in two weeks' time. This is kind of the setting of the tone. And I think I've said this to you before. Luke, in particular, more so than any of the other three Gospels, likes transition parts. He gets you to move from one major section to the other. He does this specifically in Acts in six ways. And, and, it's, and they are important in Acts because they help us break Acts up into, into the real way of actually studying and learning Acts. What you are reading in 13 is one of these transition pieces, right? So we have a, a historical piece right here that's of just wonderful enlightenment, especially to us in the 21st century. Let's, um, let's discuss it. What does anybody else see? Questions, observations? Uh, question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, in Matthew, in fact, 16, uh -huh. God tells you to take up your cross and follow him. Yep. And to repent, uh, yet nay, unless you repent. God speaks to us in different ways. Again, as I've said before, my repentance might not be your repentance. If that makes sense. If all know that we're going down a rat hole, that's one thing. But he may affect me differently than that is you. So your question, or your statement question is, you've got Matthew, the, God speaks to us in different ways. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. God speaks to us through Scripture. We interpret Scripture in different ways. I'll give you that. But God speaks to us through Scripture. Um, when you talk about repentance, uh, is your question that repentance is one, one for one person and repentance is something for somebody else? He may affect me differently than you like about your paper. You know, if he speaks to me. Through Scripture. Through Scripture. Right. So I may read something and, and you might say, well, I don't see it quite. Right. That's true. That is absolutely the case. Interpretive, uh, interpretation of Scripture that it is completely different from one person to the next. That's where the glory of Scripture works. Um, on repentance, I'm, I'm going to struggle with that, Jack. Repentance is repentance. What you have to repent may be different than me, but the actual action and the call to repentance is pretty universal. And I'm, I, I, want, I want to make sure that I'm getting the, your question right. The actual nature of and nurturing of repentance is not different between us all. What we are to repent potentially is. Yes, that I agree with. If that helps. Uh, you're making the link that we all have a cross to bear and they're different crosses. Okay, I would agree with that. But the outcome is still the same. You have to repent of it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, ma'am. An observation. You've heard of the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good, good people. people. Yep. It seems to me like it's kind of clarifying right there. Sometimes it's not about the bad people. The, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Yes. And he's clarifying to me here that no, it wasn't because of their sins that these bad things happened to them. Yes. And, 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 and you know, there's very real links here between the Job Issues that we've seen with the three friends, right, that we re reflected in Job. Is, uh, and, and Jesus being asked a question. Yes, Jerry. Uh, when he says Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, did Pilate kill them and then mingle their blood afterwards? Or is he describing that as such a brutal murder that they were doing something at the time that was, that at the time they were, at the time they must have been communing with God through sacrifice? And during that, yes, during that act of people, yes. they were killed, and that's why the blood. Was yes, you have a you, you you This is historically significant. We don't know the circumstance which is right. being described it's here in the Bible. Different things. Yes, I agree. Yes, sir. Well, a, a little light on this. Mm -hmm. During the, during this time, Pilate was building an aqueduct mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. That is and correct. These people, he took money from the synagogue to build it. And these people, there were 18 of them that were killed in an accident. That's what it's referring to. And they were judged by the Jews as having died because they were taking money from the church to work on this aqueduct. So, so that's, that is, that is, you know, most people make the connection between yeah. This solemn tattle, the, 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 
the um, the tower in Solom, they make the decision. They make that with the aqueduct. We don't have anywhere outside of the Bible that particular piece of history. We have from Josephus that he was building the aqueduct, right. and so we're making the two connections together. Um, I, 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 it's it's not it's not a stretch. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, we also know from Josephus that Pilate's, Pilate had real issues. Pilate fell out with the Jews several times. He tried to move the insignias of Caesar into the temple, or particularly even into the city was a real issue for the Jews. So much so that he relented because the people were, were prepared to uprise. And he was told that by, by the Sanhedrin, that you will have an uprising on your hands unless you change your, your stance on this, and he moved them to Caesarea. So we have lots of this in history outside of the Bible. Making the connection between the two isn't unusual. I like this from our perspective because we get to see this historically. Pilate was a real person. He did rule Judea from AD 26 to AD 37, which places Jesus at an important time, right? We, we, you get where we get the, the basic structure of where we are historical New Testament. Now, I believe that the points being made here is an important one in terms of the question they asked Jesus. Jesus doesn't get counted by it. Jeremy? Is he saying that death is, misery is not a punishment? But isn't there a correlation between death and punishment here? I, I'm, I, I don't know. He's, he's I hate to say no, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hesitate. Is there a death between sin and punishment? Yes, but not physical. It's more spiritual. He makes the important distinction that they, your time is your time. And what happens at that point is more important than the fact that the A-team were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right? He's making that distinction. He's making that repentance is a point of concern now because you can die at any time. And that's what he really comes back to clearly because he says, I tell you, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. As in, the, it is absolutely the correlation between sin and punishment, but not because of Pilate killing them or the wall falling. Right. It's the fact the punishment of death, the punishment of sin is death. Right. All, we're all offenders. Correct. We, yeah, correct. Sinners and offenders using those terms, sinner, offender, then the flip side of that is punishment for sin, being a sinner and being an offender. Correct. The fact that Luke gives us the sentence twice is important in this piece of scripture. Luke says, basically, Luke repeats himself in verse 5 as he does in verse 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's talking about the Galileans. And then, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's talking about the eighteen. But he's saying the same thing, which leads us to interpret that actually the key piece to see here is that unless you repent, you will perish. And that's spiritually. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep Jeremy, continue, please. Verse 6. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look. For three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Okay, questions, observations. This is a cracking parable. This is, this is a parable in all three synoptics, but Luke uses it very different here. We must pull that apart. Yes, Jason. Give my tree one more chance, uh, and if after this one more chance, uh, then uh, you can, then I will, will repent, and you can have the tree. Is that what he's... Yes, actually, it's really good, Jason. Uh, that he is, he is saying, give my tree one more chance. I'll give it one more chance. I like that a lot. Um, a whilst, sorry, go ahead. A tree doesn't it has to do something. Now you have this, you do have the, 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 the discussion on the fig tree is a big one in all three synoptic gospels. Um, except in, of course, the other two, Jesus curses the fig tree. 
and, and, they, and we're very comfortable that we've, this is the same parable, this is the same story. Remember, I, I keep telling you, Luke's called the journey. We don't know where he goes. He tends to go back and forth, back and forth. John distinctly makes a, I'm going to Jerusalem along the way, right? Luke doesn't. And in fact, in John's gospel, Jesus goes back and forth from Jerusalem, which Luke, I think, Vincism, don't tell the pastor, I think Luke had, uh, gives us indication here that Jesus went to Jerusalem several times as part of his ministry before actually finally going to Jerusalem as part of his passion. So this one is about the fig tree being cursed. And here, to Jason's point, the fig tree isn't cursed. And I do think we've got to find out why Luke gives us that the fig tree isn't cursed. Whilst I'm talking, somebody turn to Leviticus 19, 23, 25. It doesn't matter who it is. Um, and I want, you to, I want you to see this. There is a time structure here. Remember, parables. This isn't just my thought. Um, Dr. Brian Vickers thinks exactly the same way, and I agree with him. It's where I've got most of my thoughts on this. Every parable points to the kingdom of heaven, either realm or reign, either place or kingship, right? You have to decide in the parable which one it is, but they all point to the kingdom of heaven. And in this one here, what we're looking at here is what is the kingdom of heaven and what is the parable of the fig tree? Who's, is any, are you at Leviticus? Go ahead, read. 23 to 25. Nine, verse 19, 23 to 25. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And when you came into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit of them as inedible and forbidden to you for three years. It shall not be eaten. In the fourth year, all their fruit shall be holy for giving praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of the fruit of the trees that their produce may enrich you. I am the Lord your God. All right, so you have this, you have this clear distinction in Leviticus, right? That this issue of the trees. Remember, Jesus didn't say anything without cause. This is what is being talked about in this particular parable. Three years, new trees are planted, three years. And one year is the fourth year that everything is given to God. And then you may then take up the tree, right? In the fifth year. So here you have in the parable distinctly the same thing. You have a man and a fig tree planted his vineyard, came seeking fruit and it found none. Look, for three years now, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I've found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. I, didn't want, I don't want to make this link yet until we get to the end of 35, which we will do. But I want you to understand that we've got to, we've got to really pull out the dig around and put on manure. Could, could that be, if instead of a fig tree, could you insert man instead of a fig tree? No, but I know where you're going, and I'm okay with that. You can't insert man in the fig tree. And the reason being, Jack, is that we've got to put this beginning parable with the rest of the, of the chapter. But it will become apparent as we get down to Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. All right? But think about the dig around and put manure on. You're feeding a tree, correct? So what you have, and Jason, I really liked what you said. You said, ultimately, that, they, that, that somebody intervenes and says, give them one more year, Right? Give it one more year, of which I will dig around. You'll notice, he says, he says, Sir, let it alone this year or so until I dig around it and put on manure. So who's the person who's putting, digging around the tree and putting on the manure? The vine dresser. The vine dresser not the owner of the vineyard. Right? right? Not the owner of the vineyard. The vine dresser. And on that cliffhanger, duh, 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 we'll keep going. Right, I'll read. A woman with a disabling spirit, verse 10. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on these days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger, and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, 
be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced all the glorious things that were done by him. Such a good piece of scripture! Don't miss this. Let's go. Questions, questions observations. Come on, Kenneth. Give me a question. Give me an observation. Anyway, questions, observations? Yes, sir. I know I'm talking about, but it's absolutely appalling to me that anyone hearing this argument would agree with the fact that, yeah, that would still be the same. I mean, like, you ever, you ever witness an argument that you're not a part of and go, what an idiot? Yep. Yeah, and actually, uh, Jeremy, that's a fabulous observation. And Luke tells us that because you get right at the bottom of it, all the people rejoiced. Yeah. Right? So clearly, clearly, if you look at the structure of it, you have a magnificent moment. Oh, by the way, I get excited about these sort of things, which is why I tell you, and I guess you're here, so you can't, you must be indulgent to me. Um, this is the last time Luke mentions that Jesus preaches in the synagogue before he is crucified. Right? So we get this, that uh, this is a journey passage, he's on his way, okay? And he's teaching in the synagogue. Vincism, don't tell the pastor. I particularly like that the leader of the synagogue doesn't address Jesus, he addresses the people. And that gives us a real vision moment. That as you, because it would be the same as our sanctuary, right? Jesus is clearly a teacher that they want to hear. I've said these to you before. We often see this, this massive idea that Jesus was shunned from the synagogues. And he was shunned by the Pharisees. And they didn't want him anywhere near him. But they did. They listened to him. They, they invited him. He was, he, he was given a special moment to teach. He's teaching here, but he's not the leader of the synagogue. Andrew? I mean, the leader of the synagogue may not even be addressing the, the correct thing. Jesus saw her. She didn't come to him and ask him for healing. Correct. He and saw her, and he had compassion, and he wanted to heal her, so he did. She probably didn't even expect it. That's absolutely, and that's what we get a lot from, that Jesus sees her. Now, you could say, actually from the scripture, you could say that Jesus might have been in full flow teaching or speaking. He sees her and stops everything to do it. That would be so what Jesus did. That would be so part of what he did, right? In, we have that through all three synoptics and John, where he is, stops what he's doing in order to help somebody who's ill. Irrespective of day, which is what God will do, irrespective of what we are doing. Irrespective of what God is doing. And I think there's a real key application to that. God will drop everything for you. And I know that's so simplistic to say. But at the same time, we should be astonished in a wonderment and amazement at that. That here you have. the, 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 the And you can, we can pull this part about the law and the fact that this is the sin. That's not what I think this is about. I think this is Jesus' compassion. And my goodness, there's so many commentators that jump on. That is the woman possessed by a demon because it talks about a disabling spirit and it talks about Satan. And then some will say, well, hold on a second, Jesus never, not once in the Gospels outside of this particular passage in Luke, touches a person possessed with a demon. He never touches them apart from this particular piece. And, and I read it, I read it, read it, read it and thought, well, but Luke says he does. So that must, for me, changes everything. This is the one piece of scripture where Jesus touches somebody possessed by a demon. That's the power and the, the, the power of this piece of scripture. The fact that he touches this woman who's in the synagogue possessed by a demon, I think is even bigger in terms of what the church becomes rather than what the church is, right? That we are to welcome all disabilities and all areas of people and he will stop in order to fix what is going on. This is another kind of simplistic view of, of a small portion of this, as you said, but the thing that jumps out at me <coughs> In, in, in this very simple way is but you guys say it's okay to untie your donkey and water your cows or whatever you have but it's not okay for this woman correct and and, and, and jesus is jesus is a, a, so the law the what the what the actual authoritative person is saying in under deuteronomy leviticus the law you cannot undo a knot right, right. and and jews today have actually pushed that is you cannot turn on a light switch. It's the same thing, right? And they avoid that to death. So, it, and then he says, you cannot, and Jesus says, whoa, whoa, a second. For the, the beasts of burden of which the law allows you, you will untie the knot in order to take them to water so they don't die. But here you have a woman who's been, who's been in pain and, and, and in horror for 18 years, and she's lower than your ox and donkey. 
And to the point you made, Jeremy, you got the people there turning around going, he's right, that's really silly, these people are idiots. It's exactly what happens. And it just, and it just makes a real adversary between those that legalistically stand behind the law, even today. But that wasn't even the law. No, it wasn't. That, there was a, there was, was here's not, the law. That was not God's law. That was things that the Jews had added in over time. Agreed. And so what you have is you have this legalistic approach by the righteous or the self-righteous being the leader of the synagogue versus the reality of Jesus' healing power. At the same time, remember, we're going to keep coming back to the fig tree. At the same time, right, Jesus told this to Martha. This is Jesus' season. Who else gets to solve her problem? Who else gets to fix her affliction? Who else gets, at this moment in time, to help her out? Yeah, if Jesus walked in here today and it was his season, we'd all be cured of our afflictions. You, I, I would think that this has got to bring joy and happiness to Jesus, too. Yes, of he course. He be crucified. He wants to, he, he, he loves us, he wants to heal her. I mean, he wants to take time apart to say, hey, 18 years, that's gone. And I, these people are upset. I mean, for and it, her joy. I mean, Christ is happy, he's getting ready to be crucified, give him a moment. You know? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you've got this where he says, the woman you are free from disability and lays his hands. And I'm absolutely convinced the laying of hands on her is the untying of the knot. Which is why he talks about the donkey and the ox. It's the untying of the knot, right? And it is absolutely a precursor to the fact that the law is being fulfilled in him. Through the power of the Spirit in him, the law is being fulfilled right there in that moment. All right, we'll keep going. Jack, two-legged Jack. 18, verse 18. Yeah. Then he said, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and put in the garden, and it grew and became a large tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which, make, which a woman took, hid in three measures, Good. Questions, observations. Questions, observations. Once again, you have another parable, right? Points to the kingdom, either realm or reign. This one's easy because he says, what is the kingdom of God like? So we know that this is pointing to the kingdom. And he's talking about it growing from something very small. Small. Very big. Very big. Completely. And, and it serves a purpose. Once again, it's a tree that has to serve a purpose. It can't just be a tree. It's a place where it works to dwell. Right. So you, 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 do have, you do have this wonderful illusion of the small, right? You have the mustard seed, which is tiny. And, and in Israel, or in Judea, sorry, there must have, it does, it's not really a tree. It's more of a big bush. It's the same as, what's those trees that, that you don't like in our yard? Trees that like. No, trees you don't like in our yard. They, they look like a bush, but actually they're a tree. This is exactly what this is. They'll grow. The birds is significant. If I had a Kit Kat, which I do with my students, one of you would get it if you get it right. The birds represent the Gentiles. The birds, you get the Kit Kat. The birds represent the Gentiles. Certainly that's what we believe, yes. Because they represent the Gentiles significantly in Ezekiel and in Daniel 4. The big tree Old Testament passage of the tree of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, right? The, the birds represent the Gentiles. Do not tell me that Jesus isn't making that reference as part of this fig tree, because the whole of the chapter is certainly linking itself to what he's talking about Israel, as we'll get towards the end, right? Unleavened is a major piece within Scripture, because where is the unleavened used significantly and spiritually? In the Passover, that they had to clean it out, right? This, this small piece of sin, which isn't sin at that point, what it is, but you know my point, that's what has to be cleaned out in order for them to be clean to move forward. That even though you have the kingdom of heaven can start from something small, it's going to explode into the world, which is exactly what happened, right? This kingdom of heaven exists today. Yes, sir. Are they talking, so, right, is he also referring to the kingdom of, when they say the kingdom of God, is he talking about the kingdom of God as it also exists on, on earth? 
I mean, that's a, that's, is he talking about the kingdom of God that exists on earth? Um, you, you could, in terms of all parables or just this parable? Just this parable. I, I believe this parable is really just the kingdom of God that will exist, either exists in heaven for us as we die, or the new earth and the new heaven as it will exist, which will be the forever kingdom, right? The eternal kingdom. This, this could be that ultimately, that even the, 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 the kingdom, remember, at this point now, the birds, if the birds, if, 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 because I'm not saying it does. I'm just saying if the birds reflect the Gentiles and he's linking it back to Ezekiel and Daniel 4, I think he does. Vincism, make your own decision, right? I think that's the link. That's why he said that there is, is a link to Daniel 4. If he's saying that, then this particular parable must be about Israel. If. The reason why I'm comfortable with the if is I think the first parable is about Israel. The parable of the fig tree. And the reason why I think both these parables about Israel is because Luke has put them together where the other synoptics do not, at, and he finishes this particular piece with Jesus' lamentation over Jerusalem. And I think the link for all of them, hermeneutically, how you interpret it, is you'll interpret the whole lot together. Okay? That's my view. Sorry. Make your own mind up. That's my view. We'll continue. We'll continue. Um, Dana, would you continue reading, please? 22. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying at towards... And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying... Journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to them, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Where I do not know you where you are from. Then he will begin to say, You ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Okay, hold on right there. Questions, observations. Now we're getting to the real meat of, of the entire passage. So, he let's, so he's, he's on his way to Jerusalem. They, there you have a wonderful, remember, I, this is... This is this 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 specifically now is Luke giving us information. He is no longer going back and forth geographically, right? Which we've done since nine, chapter nine, fifty-one, which is the start of the Jerusalem, the Passion Journey in Luke. But he goes back and forth between Capernaum, Galilee, etc., etc. Now he does it. Luke is specifically giving us an important piece of information that Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem. Not for anything other than the final mission. Okay? When, now that we have that, you then need to put everything that, you've, that we've read beforehand, in, at, before this intermission, into that section that he's going to Jerusalem. And then afterwards as well. And the first thing that's said to him is, and someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. What does that mean? Walking that kind of life is not easy. And in the practical sense here and the spiritual. Um, in my Amplified, it says strive to enter the narrow door. And the word strive, it means to force yourself through it. There are days that you just don't want to do this. I went to church, I did my duty, I'm good. That's so applicably, applicably, we can then put that, that piece here now. But I want us to really understand who the door is. The door is Jesus. The door is Jesus. That's, I, I mean, I just don't have any other way to read this. Go ahead. The people that are asking him probably assume they're just automatically going to get there. Right. And he's saying, no, there's a striving. There's a, there's a striving that you have to do. There's a force. There's a, you have to make the choice. Right. To go through the hard times. To go through the hard days. To reach Jesus. And, many, and I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to because the master is going to so there's a he rises and then people are already in he shuts the door and then people have missed it 
And so, it's not just eating and drinking in my presence or me teaching you in the streets. There's more to it. There's a more. There's not a more just there. showing up yeah. on Sunday morning. Yeah, it, 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 and I'm, so, so for them too, they don't understand that that they are not automatically in just because of their Jewishness. Right. They're not in. Right. That's not what makes them in. Right, and that is that is the warning for the people of what he's saying here. And I'll get to that in the end because we need to link that back to the fig tree. But there is an applicable warning to the point you're making about where salvation is for us today. This was what the opening was for me when I've been reading it this week. Because the door is Jesus, right? And you, what, you, what vision you've got here is this constant barrage, but the door is Jesus. This is going to be full of a lot of people, Right? This will be full of a lot of people trying to get in through here. And, and there is going to be people on the other side, which is what Jesus says. I envision an hourglass. Correct. There's two essences to the sentences. There's the opportunity, the fact that Jesus is the way in, the opportunity. But at the same time, that at some point, this door closes. Okay? So what you have, if you look at 13, if you look at the entire chapter, you then have to assess there's an eschatological view that he's being argued in terms of the kingdom of heaven. As in end times. End times for us as Gentiles scattered throughout the passage, but end times for Jews as well. Remember, you cannot read scripture and without suggesting that there are still promises to the Jews that exist, but they are not open-ended promises. They still are centered around the door, which is what Jesus is talking about here. Jack, were you going to ask a question? Yes, in, in the day of Noah, same thing, people watch and they criticize just like today, when we stand in the pew, that's like 26 says, I say to you, when you see in the end, they heard him day after day, but they didn't know when because they had accepted uh, just like in the day of Noah. Uh, we, the day of what? The day of no uh, Noah. The day of Noah, sorry, sorry, the day of Noah. The southern boy is Noah. Well, Noah, okay. So, uh, just in th those days, they watched Noah and they criticized even though they heard and they saw. <coughs> just like this passage. And we see that today as well. And God's going to say, I never knew. No, Jack, no, 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 sorry. My apologies. I mean, this is even worse than the day of Noah, Jack. This is even worse than them. This is an outright rejection of the Messiah. The people before the day of Noah were cursed people with no law, with no direction, with nothing before Abraham, where God was sorry that he'd even created man, right? So this, in terms of being able to turn, there was no turning because there was no understanding of turning. That was a mess. This is even worse. It's, it's, I mean, Jesus makes that reference throughout his ministry. This is ten times worse. A hundred thousand times worse. Because this is the moment of the season, right? This is the opportunity of the season that's going on. He's talking about the fig tree and the mustard seed and the fruit that's being born. This is utter rejection. Right. Yeah, they, these, these people rejected Jesus and they thought they could still get in through works. Right. Well... Yes, but be careful. Don't, let's not pull this into a Catholic Protestant argument because that's fruitless, right? Because both of us believe in the Trinity, okay? However, there is going to be this structure of whether or not you accept the door and what the door is. That's the key. That's the key. And the Jews have the opportunity to accept the door for what it is too. Yes, sir? Yeah, I think it's also, I agree with the door, but I think it's also a comment on the relationship. It's our fault. We... It's so a comment on the relationship right. between us and God? Right. Or, or Jesus, because he's at the door. He is the okay, door. a comment on, on Jesus at the door, right. I mean, everything that leads up to this is, and I, I say this with young kids, but I just hang out with them, is it all starts with the relationship. I mean, we can go back to the ask him how to pray and how to everything else, and the repentance, <coughs> and, you know, chapter 9, and as you go through what, everything there, is he's trying to teach us how to have a relationship with him. So when the time comes to for the fruit of that relationship to be salvation, to come through the door. This is, in my 
the way that I see it, he's, it's culminating, our relationships culminate with going through the narrow door. Yes, I like that. Our relationships culminate with going through the narrow door. That we, we have understood what it means to be in front of the narrow door and the door to be open for us right. to enter. Because part of that, and I agree. Because they, they, it's a very one sided relationship that says, um, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Right. It was a very, that's a very, we hung around you, you taught this. Nothing that, it's a very shallow relationship. So if, if you read that piece of, if you read that verse, which is 26, for those of you online, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Right. Who is he talking to? He's talking to those who did not get through the door. Yes, but he's actually talking to, to he's sp specifically talking to the children of Israel. Israel yeah. who, did not, who did not follow him. They just hung out with him. Maybe they, 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 they did not take that next step in a relationship. So the warning, the, the warning is what, what we have to figure out is what this piece is here. Is this the second coming where they turn around and say, we always knew you were the Messiah, and that's problematic. Or is it the timing of now? Is it temporal? Is he talking to them now? And I believe he's talking to them now. Andrea. Back to the question in 23. Someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Is he basically saying, is it only for the Jews? Yes, he and is. Saying, That's exactly what he's right? saying. It's and us. Yes, as in, as in we are the chosen yeah. people. Who else gets to get in? So right. We're the ones getting in. And, and why... And sorry, I did, I did stop halfway and really should have read the whole thing. So let's connect that because this is a very strong Israel piece of, Israel piece of scripture. So, but he will say, I tell you, so at 28, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. So, the, the Messianic banquet is a massive, still to this day, a massive end times heaven speech for Jews. And what he's saying here is, you will look through the door and will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The massive line back to what? God's promise. God's promise, right? Except Paul pulls us into the same promise. Okay, so what Jesus is saying for you as the 21st century reader and for people, anybody reading this, got this, this piece of scripture in the 21st century. What Jesus is clearly saying here is that, yes, you are a chosen people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Yes, you are a chosen people, but you will sit and you will watch and see if you stick to this concept of chosen being the only saved. You will see the Gentiles as promised eating with the patriarchs. And that's the warning. That's the 21st application that sits today. That this Messianic banquet is real. The Messiah has come. And you will see the Gentiles sitting there eating with Abraham. Because that's where they joined the same covenant that was promised to you. It doesn't take from them that they have a bit, an opportunity to still be saved. Do you understand that? That's, that's another Vincism. Many people don't agree. I'm of the opinion that we read Revelation, that God, God never, God's word is final. He never breaks his promises. He's given these people a promise. Yeah. Right? Never breaks his promises. I cannot read scripture any other way than God will keep his promise to his chosen people. Because he made the promises before the Ten Commandments. He made them promises before the covenant. Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 9? Yes, it is. It's exactly what Paul says in Romans 9. So, importantly, Jesus here, there's a real warning here that exists today. And I want us to finish so that we can get back and make the link between the parable of the fig tree and his lament over Jerusalem. 31. At the very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. 
How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I love this scripture. Questions, observations? Who's the, who's the bigger audience? Oh, I think this audience is small. Right, that's, right. that's what I'm saying. It's, it's pretty, like, I think this audience is, I think it's distinct, it's pointed, and it's small. Does this not start in Luke 12? And it says, doesn't it? When so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were trampling one another. He began to say to his disciples first. Doesn't, isn't this one big long conversation that starts there? Right. You certainly can see it that way, apart from the transition. Okay. The, apart from the transition piece, okay. which Luke likes. Like Luke likes breaks of transitions. Okay. Um, but you can see it that way. You could see it as one big dialogue. The Luke, the transition we get is that he's now yeah. journeying towards Jerusalem. Right? Yeah. So you, you, you're going to get this, this. So what, where do we get? Let's talk about Herod. What's the lamentation of a Herod? Or you, you, there's an interesting, Luke gives us a very interesting piece in the opening. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. That seems very odd considering what's going on, right? The Pharisees wanted him dead as well. Yeah, they're currently plotting. Well, it would seem that way. They just wanted to be quiet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think that's why Luke, talking, you know? I think that's why Luke says at that very hour, as in at that moment in time, they were still very concerned that Herod was going to get Jesus. They hadn't learned enough. I, I, I'm, you're getting a, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not even sure I'm right, if I'm honest, or even if there's a right or wrong to it. It just struck me as an oddity that a Pharisee would come and warn him that Herod was out for him. You know, some of them well, were listening to yeah. them, and I think the same as you. Some of them were saying, you know, we're not finished yeah. with this yet. We want, we want to know more, so what's going on? So we need to put in why Luke puts this in. And I'm, I'm yes, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, isn't it true that everything the Pharisees did or in secret, they, they really didn't want the crowds to know that they were fine. Yeah, of course. So therefore, it's hearing. Oh, yes, sir. Any politician, especially at this time, is going to follow the crowd in mind. So, if Jesus is God, the mob, they're going to try to get on the good side of the mob. I mean, Rome built their own entire empire by controlling the mob. So, the Pharisees would have done this to look like they're on the side of Jesus still maintaining the, the power of the crowd. I mean, it's, it seems like this would have been done. This wasn't done in secret. They would have been telling him this in front of the crowd. Yeah, you. so I like that. A politician, the, the Pharisees are doing this because they're following the crowd. We've got Jesus, Herod. Yes, sir. Yes, Jeremy. I, I think Herod doesn't want an uprising. And I think he might be going to the Pharisees. And this, again, just looking at the bigger picture, the Pharisees probably in some way have already conspired with Herod. Remember, Herod is going to, was looking to pardon one of them. Yes. And it's not, and he's looking to pardon Christ. Herod, Herod is probably, he's, a, he's an astute guy to, to the point earlier. And I think Herod is going, he's telling the Pharisees, hey, look, before I go and have this guy killed, before all the, because you got to put a plan in motion way before it occurs, right? He might be going to the, Herod goes to the Pharisees, look, try and see if you can make the problem go away before I have to kill the guy. So this might be, make the problem go away. And I'm thinking Christ probably knows that, that the Pharisees are coming because they are being told to by Herod, try and get rid of, try and get rid of the problem before I kill the problem. But truthfully, did Herod have the power to kill him by this time? Uh -huh. Had yeah. he done the Roman yeah. rule? Absolutely. Okay. So what you're actually, what you're linking there, Nelson, is very important. Jesus is in Herod's territory, which gives Herod ultimate power, right? But Herod's territory is not Jerusalem. That's governed by Pilate. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now we get to read this from a 21st century look rather than a look of what was going on. Luke's giving you a very important piece of information in the reading. Is that actually, and Jesus says it about the prophets going to Jerusalem. No matter what Herod wants to do or the Pharisees, God wanted Jesus to die in Jerusalem. Okay? This is God's plan. <laughs> we get that from the fact that he's now on his journey. It doesn't matter what would have happened at this point. 
Jesus was going to fulfill his mission, as he had already made the decision to do, even up to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was going to die in Jerusalem. The lament is for Jerusalem. That even the Pharisees who want him dead, and Herod want him dead, will not stop God's mission. Right? So when we get to this, when we get to Jesus' lament, he talks about the prophets and the stones and those who were sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together? That's such a lament. That I've been to Jerusalem many times and I've taught and I've spoken and you haven't listened. I've tried to gather you and brood you under my wings. I've tried and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken and I tell you, you will not see me till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What does he mean by that? This is what we'll finish on. This is the prophecy of the fall of Rome, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. This is the temple. The house is the temple. Do not miss that Jesus, or Luke, in writing under the Holy Spirit's guidance, says, Behold, your house is forsaken. Not my house is forsaken. That's recognition. Right. So, I mean, clearly their, their temple is going to fall, but that temple was their temple. Correct. It had nothing to do with the covenant any longer. You will not see me until you say it isn't a visual sight. It's a, a recognition of the heart. Right. Very Absolutely. It is a recognition of the heart. That the temple was so important to Jews. The, the temple where they were they were convinced was, was, was God's presence, which it was, right? But what they, what, they, what they fail to see and understand now is that God's presence has changed, which it can do. God doesn't change. His presence has changed. The decision of where he resides has changed, right? Which is the heart issue that Andrew's just said. But I want you to go back to this. I want you to go back to this, okay? And Pilate, the very beginning of 13, we get a beautiful historical note of Pilate. Don't miss that Luke has given us information that Jesus talks about one day and the day tomorrow and on the third day. That would have meant nothing to the people hearing it then and there. But it means something to you because you know what happens on the third day. Right. right? Now, if there were those in, the, in, the, in reading this, listening to Jesus, could have made the link with Jonah, so be it because they'd have heard it before. But actually, you get to see the third day today. If the third day sits here, right, Jesus, in terms of the fig tree, is going to talk about three years of fruitlessness for the people of Israel being his ministry. I've worked for three years and I've had no fruit in where I'm working. And then ultimately, this one year, right, can be seen as the time that was spent in absolutely the growth of the Christian church, which the Jews fought vehemently. Vehemently. And, and people were mur crucified, murdered by the Jewish authorities sent by Paul in order to stop this, the martyrdom of Stephen. Remember, Jesus talks about the prophets being martyred in Jerusalem. Stephen was martyred in Jerusalem. Yeah? You've got this whole link that goes on. Because ultimately, then, and, the, and he says, I'm going to give them one more year. The vine grower says, give me one more year to plant a manure. Give me one more year for the Holy Spirit to work through the people I leave, behind within the Jews. Hear the letter of Hebrews, the letter of Romans, the letter that Paul writes. Paul goes into the synagogues. One more year of trench, one more year of manure. And if that does not work, you can cut it down. And that's what happens in AD 70. And it's never been built since. Okay? So when you link 13, this is a strong, strong, eschatorical, redemptive passage of Scripture. It's a massive redemptive passage of Scripture. That there, it, the gift that is given has to be received, not rejected. That additional one, is that, the ear, is that, the door, is that the door closing also or no? Yeah. The door closing, the ending of what it goes on, right? That there's going to be a cut in the temple. And once the temple ended, something else has to take its place. In terms of the redemptive, eschatological nature from the very beginning of time, the Garden of Eden, the first temple. Okay? So at this point, the new, this temple is over for the Jewish people and something takes its place. The church replaces the temple. We are the temple. We are the church which resides in ourselves. That is the redemptive area where it is. And the only way, the only way to understand that redemptive, eschatological, end times view is that God the Father... God, who is the judge, 
versus God the Son who is judged through the, through the ministry of the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus. The Trinity is absolutely in play in this passage, passage of Scripture. And the Trinity is in play for the Jews to understand as well as it is for everybody in this world today to understand that Jesus is God. Not as the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons think or the Arians think or people who think there's three gods. There is one God and he's in three persons. And the only way to truly be saved is to understand that and to have it in your heart and say Jesus is Lord and understand that Jesus is God. and He's the only door to, through which you will enter. We can go, sing, dance, get naked. I don't care anymore. Have a great day.